We live in a constantly changing world where the speed of information is changing how we think and act and connect with one another. When people in a society lose faith in their institutions, in God and in each other, the nation collapses. We need help rebuilding trust and tying it all together. Welcome to All That To Say, a podcast exploring the interrelatedness of all things in long form conversation. Author, leadership coach, and CEO of Building Champions, Daniel Harkavy joins the podcast to talk surfing, growing up Jewish, and the responsibilities of influence in the modern world. Daniel Harkavy is our guest today. Daniel, thanks for joining us. Jim, it's great to be with you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> and we're already off to a good start. This, yes. guy, this guy is easy, he's smooth, and uh, he's at his home. So maybe that's why he's so laid back. Daniel, you're in your home, which is, where is that, your home? I'm in Westland, so I'm about uh, 20, 25 minutes outside of Portland, Oregon. So you're what I would describe as the Portland Metro. Yeah, we're in the Portland Metro, although we live out on some land with llamas and things of that sort. So it feels like the country, but... I still can make it into town and and have a nice dinner when the restaurants are open. I totally get that. And of course, we live in an age where not every restaurant is open, certainly not indoors. And that's been true in Portland. And uh, have you lived in Portland uh, in that area for all of your life or no, you've been there just for a while? Yeah. So the last uh, 25, 26 years have been here in the Northwest and in this area of Portland. And the first 30 years of my life were spent down in Southern California in the suburbs of Los Angeles between LA and, and we'll just call it Disneyland. Uh, well, I've, I've been to Disneyland, I've been to LA, so I can kind of see that roadmap. Now, you know, yeah. I'm from Seattle, so I yes. totally get the Pacific Northwest vibe, the groove, the yeah. overcast and the brilliant blue sky when it breaks through. I also have been to California yeah. a great deal. Both are West Coast neighborhoods, but quite different, honestly. Yeah. So you've made the transition after spending the first part of your life, I think 30 years or so in Southern Cal, up to Portland, yeah. and you're saying, yeah. you know what, I'm good. Portland is my home. I'm so yeah. fine here. Yeah, we love it here. We love it here. Uh, the, just the absolute visual beauty, the space, uh, a bit of the culture, and a little bit of, you know, keep Portland weird, I like. Um, yeah, it's just a, been a great place to, to raise the kids and, and uh, to spend a good chunk of our life. So we really love it here. I get that. And you're our guest today in part, Daniel, uh, and I say in part because you have so much more going for you than just your profession, but mm. uh, you have created a company. You have found success with this company called Building, Building Champions. You do mm-hmm. executive coaching. You have uh, had enormous influence, uh, not just in the lives of people that intersect with you and your team, but with the people they intersect with. I mean, there's so much to unpack there, but I have to think, if I was growing up in Southern California— and I'm just imagining myself as a young guy, maybe a teenager or a young adult, guy in my late teens or early 20s. Were you down there dreaming of, you know, someday I'm going to be an executive life coach? Or <laughs> was your world framed differently? How would that yeah, be? Yeah, back, back when I was young, my world was framed around the next big swell. And, uh, and then anytime I could get with my now wife, who back then was my girlfriend. So ah, I, uh, I never saw this coming. Back, back when I was young... Uh, there was no such thing as executive coaching. You know, executive coaching wasn't even a thing you could find when I started this company in 96. It was really a, a new um, a new vocation. So I grew up in Southern California. Um, I think my dreams and aspirations were at some point I would be an attorney because I had rel- a relative that was an attorney. I wanted to be a corporate lawyer, but I was awful in school. Uh, it just never did it for me. Um, and like I said, being a surfer, swells would come and then classes would be missed. And uh, I actually got turned down to a school back in, in the 80s, which was known in California as probably one of the more easy uh, four years to get into. It had a party reputation and it was ideal for surfers. And they turned me down. <laughs> so I knew that uh, the study required to be an attorney wouldn't be it. So I got into to banking. I was into real estate when I was young. I always worked really hard and I just kind of found my, my way here. I felt like God, God just paved the way and it's a, a long, beautiful story where I'm really grateful, but well, not one that was planned. I'm hearing you say that uh, living close to the beach, 
uh, yeah. a surfboard, the waves, uh, the party crowd, just, I mean, all the things that we dream about when you don't live in California is like, was like a real thing. Uh, I wish they all could be California girls. I grew up with that song. Uh, I mean, yeah. so you're telling me you kind of were in that groove and well, later here, settled down. Yeah. So can you see this? <laughs> I see, see that. that? Look at yep. That says hooligan. So I'm still friends with all my high school buddies and yep. we still surf together all the time. There's about 18 in this posse. Now we're just old, but we surf together still. And uh, the surf culture hasn't died. And it was a lot of fun back then. And, and it's still a major part of, of who I am today. Uh, it's still where I feel the most peace. And, and uh, it's the best church that I, that I ever go to. So I, I really that. love that. But now I'm just going to reflect. Surfing to me, because I, I am not a surfer. In fact, I, I had my family out in Hawaii last uh, spring break before the pandemic uh, shut the islands down and everything else. Anyway, tried a little surfing there with my uh, kids, my grandsons. I, I'm just, I'm a complete loss. It was terrifying. I'm just, <laughs> and, and I'm trying to interpret why was that such a problem for me? And then I'm trying to analyze you in for my armchair therapy place. Is mm. it possible that someone who's drawn to surfing is someone who is willing to take risks uh, willing to take the fall. Uh, we're going to reach for something, even knowing that it may not work every time. Is that is that a part of Daniel's life uh, frame? Yeah. If you want to do the real armchair work, you ask why. Like, what was it that caused you? And uh, yeah, that is definitely a part of me. When I was young, I grew up. Um, I grew up in a in a time and in an area where um, there weren't a lot of Jewish folks, and I'm Jewish. Uh, both parents, all grandparents, you know, bar mitzvah, the whole deal. And uh, there was a fair amount of anti-Semitism. Wasn't good at school, was super small, wasn't good at sports. Every human needs to belong. Mm -hmm. And I gravitated towards more of the troublemaking scene, skater, drummer, then surfer. Mm -hmm. And then when you've got that fight and flight background as a result of you know, some discrimination, which was very real in my younger years. You want to prove yourself somewhere. And the water was a great place for me. I loved it. And uh, yeah, sometimes the motive for going out and surfing uh, in certain situations, you have to examine yourself, say, wait, why am I doing this? Is this smart? Yeah. Is this a wise thing to do? Yeah. I was just in Hawaii all of January, which I've spent a good number of winters in Hawaii since I was a teenager. And I have to go through all of that. Okay, why are we doing this? Don't push. You're a grandpa. So <laughs> yeah, it, there you go, my therapist. You know, this it was so revealing, and thanks for sharing that. But now you've just opened up another door I just have to knock on. And that is, go. you said you grew up Jewish in a world that was not necessarily sympathetic to Jewish community, culture, sure. or faith uh, parameters. And, and you described how that was difficult. C can you illustrate that for me? And for instance, how did that actually work for you? In terms of the yeah. challenge of it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when you're young, I, I moved from one neighborhood to the next, which meant switching schools uh, when I was 10, fifth grade. And um, for some reason, uh, it must have been around the high holidays or something, and I missed uh, some days of school. And then uh, it was later found out that I was Jewish. And back then, I was proud of it. It was something that was nice. Um, but then later, it turned out to be something that was a bit of a, a deficit uh, because you could get bullied for that. And then, you know, from junior high all the way through high school, there was a nickname and it was BNJ, Big Nose Jew. So you learn as a little guy, you can only run so many times and then you have to turn around and you start fighting. You turn into a bully, uh, turn into a bit of a wild man to intimidate those that would discriminate against you or want to hurt you. You just come, you know, the best way to, to back then in my old life, the best way to calm a bully down was to punch him in the nose before they got you. And yeah. That was part of my, my story. And, and that led all the way up, you know, even into my young working years. I, I started working young. I worked really hard, was very money motivated when I was young uh, because I could be good at it, could, could be good at work, could, you know, outwork a lot of, of my peers. And, uh, and all of that led up to, you know, young 20s, age 22, where I had a big, big faith change. And, uh, and I want to talk about that, uh, Daniel. Sure. But 
one more question before we get there. Do, do you think that that pursuit of money and you know the work the work ethic and so on was engaged in some way of proving yourself uh, or, yeah. or trying to prove your worth to a world around you that you weren't sure actually accepted you? Absolutely. Yeah, everybody wants to belong, so it's an identity issue. It's, you know, we all we all do ourselves well to ask ourselves questions around why do we feel certain ways question those feelings, questions those thoughts and those beliefs, because those, the identity, the feelings, the thoughts and belief then form and, and engage actions that impact relationships and uh, habits, which ultimately lead to results that we get in every aspect of our life. So no doubt about it. A lot of my early success was to prove that I was good. You know, and it you, was to prove. And by that measure, you did. In other words, I did. if that was the game, you played it well, and, yeah. uh, but it didn't lead you maybe to the, uh, the satisfaction you might have hoped for. And so you just described 22 was a, an important year for you. What happened then? Yeah, yeah so, um, so a little bit more backstory. So I start working when I'm really young. I bought my first home when I was a teenager. Um, I worked in restaurants. I worked construction. Then at about 17, I got into office supplies, printing and office furniture, working for um, a friend's father uh, between construction, the restaurant business, and this office supply sales job. I met a man who was a very successful um, entrepreneur. He owned six businesses, and uh, his primary business was a mortgage banking firm. When I was trying to get into San Diego State, he offered me a job and said, Daniel, if you will come here and work with us, I guarantee you, you'll, you'll do much better than you would if you went to school. We'll teach you a lot. So I ended up doing that. And uh, so I did that. I started there when I was 20. And by the time I was uh, 22, um, I had climbed to one of the top three in the firm. There were more than 100 of us. And... Uh, I was making really good money driving the Mercedes, owning different properties. And who needs San Diego the party State? Life. <laughs> no San Diego State. I get it. And, uh, and then I was in a skiing accident, Jim. And that skiing accident um, happened at a time where I was single, dating a lot of different girls. Uh, again, you know, 22, my own home, a lot of, a lot of habits and party life that weren't good, making a lot of money. Skiing accident leads me to three surgeries. My previous girlfriend, who I absolutely adored, really recommitted her life to Christ. She was a Christian. So uh, she, she and I were on again, off again over the years. And, and she ended up breaking up with me probably a year before the skiing accident. And I had some other friends that made similar decisions and had radical life chains changes. And everybody, when I was young, would always ask me if I knew Christ as my Messiah. I mean, in Southern California, you had all sorts of movements down there back in the seventies and, and early eighties. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll condense the story. I did a lot of exploration, met with different pastors and rabbis and Holocaust survivors, read a whole bunch. And during this time of surgery and rehab uh, on the leg, um, I just realized that, you know, alone, not as much fun, uh, making a ton of money, there was something missing. And what was missing was, uh, for me, the Messiah that was promised to the Jews. And I, I found him by myself, reading through the Psalms, reading through Isaiah, and then reading through the New Testament, and, uh, and then realizing, wow, this guy in the, in the New Testament was the promised Messiah that was talked about back in Isaiah. And, uh, and I couldn't believe it. I became one of those folks that I never wanted to become a Jesus freak. And uh, back then I just was like, no, absolute best decision of my life, Jim, best decision of my life. Am I hearing you say that uh, in this moment where your, your life came to a pause, at least mm -hmm. uh, consequent to this accident and, and a lot of reflection, a time of self uh, reevaluation, so on that the scripture itself I, I'm hearing you describe a scenario where the scripture itself almost supernaturally, I, I, would, I would say the Holy Spirit using the scripture perhaps, but your own independent search of the Old and New Testaments brought you to a completely new understanding of who yeah. you were and who God is and who Jesus is. Am I catching that right? 
Yeah, it had to be that way. But, you know, it wasn't like all of a sudden one day I just opened the scriptures mm -hmm. and saw the light. It wasn't like that. It was a whole series of people planting seeds, fertilizing seeds, asking questions, praying for me, serving me, loving on me when I was unlovable. I mean, it was just all of these wonderful, wonderful light bearers. Uh, probably the, the, the most important of all was my now wife, Sherry. Um, but it was all of that leading me up to this point where I, I wanted to know. I wanted to know if God was real and uh, not just Jesus, but God, right. you know, am I a random accident or am I a created for purpose? And I kind of went through a whole tournament, a thinking tournament. Is there a God? Yes or no. If the answer is no, what's that mean? Random accident, no pur purpose. If yes. Okay, good. Now I'm created. Now who is he? So now we start looking at who he is and we start looking at the different faiths and the different religions. We look for the intersections. We see the Hebrew scriptures are a common, common ground for many. And we go, hmm, that's cool. I'm born into that tribe. I believe that. So we start studying there, meet with people who have more expertise than do I, and pray. You know, I can remember praying uh, during some difficult times during my young teenage years. I would pray. I had no idea to who, but it was always out of pain. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and then you fast forward to age 22, and it was really Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, that for me, it was just undeniable. And then Isaiah 9, 6, where unto us a child will be born. And then you hear all of the names that'll be called, including mighty God. Wait, a child will be called mighty God? What's the problem here, people? Like, I got it. It makes yeah. sense. The puzzle fits, so, all the pieces fit. Yeah, but I never saw it up until that time. Didn't want to. Well, most extraordinary though, because you're describing a supernatural phenomenon, it seems to me. Many independent threads, which you would look at as independent at the time, are woven together yeah. to bring you to a new fabric. And uh, from 22 till now, you're in that same place, that there is a God. And he is oh, best yeah. understood, and uh, we can relate to him through Christ, through Jesus. Absolutely. So I'm wondering, if, as you come to this realization as a young man, successful by every measure of this world, but suddenly a, a, a radical alteration of your faith frame, how does your family respond to that? Were they uh, like you know, if our son is happy, we're good for it. Or, well, are you sure you know what you're doing? How'd that come down? It was more of the, are you sure you know what you're doing? I was, I was fortunate. My parents uh, just loved and adored me, still do, which is a, an amazing gift at this stage of my life. Um, and they accepted. Uh, they weren't pleased. There were certain members of the family that were probably pretty upset. Right. Um, but, you know, fast forward, I had them all in a Bible study with me every single week, like within six to 12 months later, just to help them to understand the Hebrew scriptures. Because now I was so far advanced in my knowledge of the Hebrew scriptures, because we were what I would consider to be holiday Jews, Jim. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done a lot of thinking about how do we Jews exist and, and what makes us Jewish. And, you know, you've got bloodline through mom, and then you have, uh, you know, uh, You've got faith, or maybe you've got um, maybe you've got conversion, uh, or maybe it's just tradition and bloodline. There's all these different different ingredients to how us Jewish people identify with being Jewish and and what's our story. And my family was really just holiday. We knew we were Jewish. We celebrated it. There was pride in being Jewish, but there wasn't a God connection. I actually was a Hebrew school dropout and read. Uh, all of the required scriptures for my, my bar mitzvah in English, just to please my, my grandparents. Right. So God was never a major component in our Judaism. So when my parents and family heard me saying, I'm really excited about God and the God of the Jews, that was a different conversation, right? So not happy, maybe a little threatened, a little worried. Afraid, you know, maybe. Is, yeah, afraid. You know, am I a part of a cult now? What's this mean? And it's been quite the journey now for, you know, the last 35 years or so. So, But you moved on and your wife, Sherry, came along with you or she was already there. Yeah. Oh, she, she and I were separated. She was my, she was my first phone call after making my, my decision. And, uh, you know, she couldn't believe it because she'd seen crazy, crazy Daniel for when well, we met when we were 11. Mm -hmm. So met when we were 11, married at 23, started dating at 16, 
and from 16 to, to 22, there were a lot of highs and a lot of lows with us because I was not good. So, um, but she saw the change and had faith and believed and still loved me. And uh, we started dating a few months later. A few months after that, we were engaged and the next year married. It's been 33 years this July. It stuck. Oh, phenomenal. Well, I mean, honestly, another, uh, another evidence of God's goodness. I'd say in your story so far, I'm just, it's like a rich narrative. And I know, Daniel, you're the author of books and uh, we want to yeah. talk about one of those today, but honestly, write that autobiography. Come on. You're already, you're already practically on Netflix uh, with your story. I yeah. don't mean to be flip about it. It's just very yeah. inspiring and powerful. And well, thank you. And as, as, as you've disclosed that you've also thrown out a few more uh, clues about Daniel. Mm. And, and one is, you know, am I created by God? Am I the product of creation or simply blind random chance and so on? Do I have purpose? Oh, purpose. Now there's a word. And it seems to me uh, that purpose has really become a driver for you, not only in your own life, but helping others discover how to maximize, achieve, recognize, develop, pursue some kind of purpose in life. And uh, that brings us to your, your avocation for leadership. Uh, mm. So, I mean, you... You started out in banking and uh, have developed into this executive coach. When did you first see yourself as as a leader? I mean, that's you know, even as as you described the bad boy Daniel, um, rebellious Daniel, uh, tough guy Daniel. It sounds like somebody that was leading. I mean, there's some other. You're conscious of other people watching you. You're you're reacting to an audience. Yeah. But that's yeah. really conscious of leadership. I'm just trying to understand. Did you? fall into this idea of I'm going to be a leader and help others find that in themselves as you matured after your conversion to Christianity? Or is that something in you that you can recognize even before that? So uh, I just recently published a book. It just came out uh, in October of 2020 called The um, Seven Perspectives of Effective Leaders. And in it, I have a, a thesis, and that is that a leader's effectiveness is determined by just two things, the decisions they make and the influence they have. End of story. That, Jim, is a whole conversation for you and I to explore probably at another time. But the influence piece is a big deal. It's a major ingredient to leadership effectiveness. And I believe that we all have influence or the opportunity to influence one another. And the question is, is our influence on one another one that is good, neutral, or bad, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll take you back to probably 11 years old. And my mom's first cousin was like an aunt to us. Her kids were really my first cousins in, in relationship, love them, still do, just beautiful humans. And my, my aunt, Eileen, she just passed away this last year during this COVID reality and we didn't get to celebrate her the way we'd like to. But I remember I was the oldest of all of the cousins and I remember being a troublemaker. And uh, she called me out over breakfast and she said, you know, Danny, I've noticed you have a lot of influence. And she said, I'm really worried that if you don't learn how to use it for good, you're going to hurt a lot of people. She said, but if you learn how to use it for good, you're going to help a lot of people. And it stuck. And I remember that. Well, I continued to use it for bad for years, but that was the first time I, I had somebody older than me transfer belief into me, which is a whole nother story we'll talk about later because I just started another organization to do the exact same thing Aunt Eileen did for me. I want to do that in, in America's young adults, that set path. We'll talk about it later. So when did I first realize I was a leader? And it was when I was given the opportunity at the age 23 to become a manager in this mortgage banking firm. And I never was conscious of the fact that I had leadership abilities. I just didn't, it wasn't here. I was always solo contributor, all about me, uh, no team, never a sports guy. So, you know, I was never really put into that place. But when I got into uh, banking, and I had a team of two others the next day. One of them was gone. So it was myself and one other. And then within the subsequent years, built up a, a pretty mighty force in the business to where 
six of the top 10 I had recruited, trained, developed, and they all really excelled. And, um, and then I was given the opportunity to continue to lead and grow. And next thing you know, I had a few hundred teammates uh, in offices throughout the Western United States when I was 26, 27 years old. And, and then I knew. I was like, oh, okay, I got it. The consciousness of influence is a, is a huge revelation, it seems to me. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm just identifying with your story in the sense that uh, I always wanted to avoid being seen mm. because I feared that if I was seen, someone would make fun of me and because I had my own, my own dysfunction in terms of I was not the athlete, I was not that guy, and uh, nobody wants me on your ball team, that kind of thing. But, you and me both. But then coming to a place where I suddenly realized when I kind of matriculated out of uh, the high school teen scene. Yep. Yeah, people were actually paying attention to what I said or did. And it, it's, almost, it's almost startling and frightening and bewildering all at once. So I, yeah. I so resonate with what you're saying. And that, that, led, that, that led you eventually into, let's talk about building champions here. You, you created this company still in play that coaches... Uh, executive leaders and so on. Tell us about Building Champions. What does it do? Why did you start it? What did you hope would be achieved? Okay, so um, I'm going to plug books. Okay, I, I wrote Becoming a Coaching Leader back in 2007. And my belief around that book was if you, if you will do what I say in that book, you'll put my, my executive coaching company out of business. I mentioned that because it gives you the backstory to Building Champions. When I realized at the age 23, 24, I have a leadership gift, what I realized was leadership's really not that difficult. If you will meet with really humble, smart people who are good, and then you figure out how to help them to gain clarity on what they want in business and life, and then you, you lock into what it is that they want, and then you help them to identify actionable steps that they can take along the way to go from where they're at to where they want to go, and then along the way, you encourage them and encourage them and encourage them and support them and resource them. Even if they work for your competition, at some point, they'll join you and then they'll flourish. So I became a coaching leader. No idea what it meant. All I did was I filled my days with helping really switched on humble people that wanted to meet with me. I had a little script. Hey, I hear you're one of the best of the best. You got a great reputation in your in your community, you know, everyone talks about you as being superb. I'd love to learn from you. Let's see if there's some cross-pollination. We can share some ideas. I guarantee you it'll be an hour well spent. What do you say? People would meet with me. And I would always just meet with the best of the best. And to this day, I still love that practice. Gave my kids that advice when they were young. All of that led to me eventually running the entire company's production when I was 26, 27. Company goes public when I'm like 28. Stayed there until the age 30. Have this huge crisis of belief again. Now, seven years into my faith journey, uh, you know, uh, after making a, my decision to follow Yeshua. And, um, and uh, I realized I was still chasing the wrong thing. Still very money motivated. And I was traveling all the time. But you're, you're following kids. Jesus. I mean, you, you're following Jesus as you understood how to do that. But at age 30, you have a moment where you think, wait a minute, there's just, this is off. Yeah. There, there was a lack of um, integrity or congruence between who I wanted to become and who I was in the moment. And I knew there was more. Mm -hmm. I had offices throughout the, the Western US. So I was on airplanes all the time. Three young kids, beautiful wife. And... Uh, I was at a Promise Keeper event. Um, this is in year two of a succession strategy to where the, the founding CEO who recruited me was grooming me to be one of the two that would replace him. Guy just goes public, et cetera. And I come back from a Promise Keeper event. I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm stepping off. It's making great money, full of pride. My wife said, good, step off. Let's do this. I resigned, took a year off sabbatical, moved from Southern California up here to, to Oregon. And it was in that year where 
I ideated, prayed, and envisioned different business opportunities because I wasn't wealthy enough to just call it quits. I needed to work, but I did have the gift of, of having the means to take the year off, relocate, and start a business, which not everybody has. I was very fortunate. And that is a part of my story that I, I always say, I know, I know, I, I don't know why it happened, but God poured favor on me there. Yeah, and, and, and so what I realized was, I just want to clarify for our, our audience who may not be familiar with Promise Keepers. Promise Keepers was a, a, a movement of men, Christian men generally, mm -hmm. especially in the 1990s, where there were these mass meetings of guys get together often in athletic stadiums and so on and, and listen to teaching and uh, the word of God was unpacked and so on. You're telling me that it was in a, an environment like that, that you came to this realization Absolutely. that prompted all of this life change. And I just yeah, wonder, do you was, have any recollection of what it was that you heard there or experienced there? What, again, maybe it's, I'm oversimplifying it. Was it a message or was it just the whole experience of uh, being together with all these other guys who are trying to find their way to be the best? It was a series of messages. You know, it was everybody from Steve Farrar to, um, oh, come on, big Dallas pastor, big chariz charismatic pastor. Uh, <laughs> there are several of those. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. This guy's phenomenal. His name will come to me. But it was just the whole thing. You know, I think it was really just being in that environment, praying, thinking, considering, and also acknowledging the fact that I was running really hard. And the question was, well, what's this all about? What For what doing? purpose? Yeah. Yeah. So take the year off, explore different ideas. One was a surf shop. So a surf, skate, snowboard shop where I could minister to and love on the young Dannys. All of these young people that, you know, that population, that demographic, we get into trouble. And I thought, oh, I can create an environment where I can love on them and be a living example of who Christ is to them. Because there was one of those in my life. He was a part of my story. That was idea one. Idea two was I was going to open a bagel restaurant. And they were new, like these chains of bagel restaurants. They didn't thought, exist oh. then. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought I'm going to open a bagel restaurant because then I can wake up early. I can go in. I can be the guy that greets you. I'll get to know everybody in the community. I'll, again, be this example of who Christ is, hospitality, welcome people in. By noon, I'll be done. I'll go home and I'll be with my kids and my wife and we'll go surfing or go playing up here in Oregon. Right? That was the second idea. And then the third idea was I would take the best part of my banking job, which was coaching switched on people, and I would charge people for that because I knew that most businesses lacked that in their leaders. And I figured if I did that back in banking, the industry I came from, and I concept proofed it there, it, it would grow. And I put together a business vision where, you know, we'll nail mortgage banking, I'll do it out of my house, it'll be great. At some point when I'm ready, I'll hit the gas and I'll move into five different industries and start to build the team. But for right now, it's just gonna be in the home office. And within, Gosh, within the first year or so, uh, I had a wait list and I spoke at a, a conference and 102 people signed up 20 minutes after I spoke and had put a few clients up on the stage. And then it was like, oh, we're off to the races. We need to start growing now. And uh, we just celebrated 25 years in business. And basically what we do is we fill our days with journeying with leaders to help them to figure out how to lead themselves, their teams, and their businesses with more intentionality so that they get the results they want in business and in life. That's what we do all day long. Leadership development, executive coaching, CEO mentoring, executive teamwork, and then all of our frameworks and models. We pump through enterprises and organizations to help them to build these cultures that are magnetic and more effective. Okay. So talking about books, I've got one here. Living Forward. Mm -hmm. uh, it talks about life plan. And this is a great read. Tell Thank me, you. what is it about building champions? Or maybe it's reflected in this book. If I show up and knock at the door, what am I going to get? Where am I going to be led? Yeah. So um, one of my absolute beliefs is that self-leadership always precedes team leadership. And now having done this for a few decades, and as a result of my first decade in mortgage banking, I saw what would cause organizations to fail. And I just learned early on, early on that organizations fail when the leader fails. 
So the health of the leader determines the health of the business. It's an absolute truth. You can't deny it. You can have an unhealthy leader build something pretty fantastic for a short period of time, but in time it will collapse as does he or she. It's just, it's unavoidable, right? Look back on history. It's a truth, absolute truth. So how we lead ourselves really matters. Now, I'm a leader. I'm a CEO. I've started a few businesses. And um, as I have felt myself drift, as I have felt myself get off course, I've seen the direct negative impact on my team. And then I've seen the direct negative impact of myself and my team on the overall organization. It's, it's not rocket science. It's just, mm-hmm. It just makes complete sense. All right. So why life planning? When I started building champions, one of the things that I wanted to do was I wanted to help people who made a lot of money not go bankrupt in the other areas of their life. One of the reasons I left my career was because as I looked forward at leaders who were 20 years older than me, 25 years older than me, my parents' age, what I saw was destruction and divorce in one corner of the corporate office. I saw addiction and mistresses in the other with kids that did not like this individual. And then in the third corner, what I saw was white powder substance and a lot of hardship. And I thought, a parking lot has Ferraris. It has Porsches. We hang out in mansions. I don't want to help people get there. So as a guy who's starting a company, what I wanted to do was bring a lot of my focus when I was a branch manager back in my 20s into a business. And what I did when I was in my 20s was I would help people not only accomplish professional goals, I would help them to accomplish personal goals. I would say, yeah, yeah, good. You want to make another $100,000. That's amazing. Is there anything you want to see improve in your life? How are you doing in your relationships? How about your health? Any funny things holding you back? And I would just get real with people. So what I realized at a pretty young age is that I'm not the only broken one. We're all broken. And we can all get stuck in this cultural current that pulls us off track. And then we wind up at a place where we have regret. So the very fundamental foundational first move that we make at Building Champions is we help our leaders to build a life plan. And a life plan is nothing more than a plan written by you for you that determines how you want to accumulate net worth in all areas of your life, not just your career and your finances. It talks about you playing this unique stewardship role in these accounts that you can either add to or deplete from. And this unique stewardship role, it's your role and nobody else's. Like nobody else can, you can't delegate being a husband. You can't delegate delegate being a mom. You're it. You're the one. You can't delegate being the steward of your body. You can't delegate or put off your relationship with your creator. Uh, You know, your impact in the community. There are all these different accounts that I make decisions about, as do you. Are we going to make decisions that lead behavior, lead us to behaviors that are going to accumulate net worth or not? Well, it's really important for us as humans to take an inventory. We're told in the Psalms, so teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as the wise, I'm not as the fools, but as the wise, redeeming your time because the days are evil. We're told to be aware, right? Because we only have so many days and a wise person has a conviction around that. And they don't want to waste away any of the opportunities to make a difference in the world, in the community, in the neighborhood, in the family. And uh, so starting Building Champions, I I said, I'm going to help leaders to build plans, which none of them have ever done. No one's ever taken time to contemplate and really think about who they want to be, not what they want to do, but who they want to be in all areas of their life. I'm going to help them to get that done. And then out of that, one of those accounts will be their career account. And then we'll start off and we'll help them to build their vision, their strategy, their plans. And uh, we'll work on all of the business best practices and, and thinking that will enable them to flourish in business so that as they flourish in business, they'll also be flourishing life as a result in life as a result of their life plan. And then the beautiful outcome of that is that their teams will have more admiration, more respect because they see somebody who is congruent and cares about the whole human, not just quarter by quarter 
results, right? So 25 years of doing it, the book written. I just started a new organization to help young adults to do this set path. Mentioned that earlier. We're going to bring life planning and mentorship to America's youth because it works. And would you say that in in a quarter century of doing that, that uh, you find people that really excel at this? Of course you do. Uh, that's why you're still in business. Uh, are there people who fail or it doesn't seem to be a good match or someone says, well, I, I hear that, but it's not working for me? Yeah, absolutely. And and I don't believe that that our way or my way is the only way. And I don't believe it's for everybody. So I'm not trying to impact everybody. I'm trying to impact the, for my building champions company, it's leaders. And if leaders resonate with Better humans make for better leaders. Truth number one, self-leadership always precedes team leadership. Team leadership always precedes organizational impact and results. If they say, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. And then when I say, you know, um, building leadership capacity is not only a, a strategic move, but it's a corporate responsibility to build better humans and to build their capacity. It's like, it's what we're supposed to do as, as leaders. If they don't resonate with that, uh, just get up and I wish them well. And I say, I'm not your guy. We're not your firm. And we move on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little pricey here. Is it fair for me to say that building a life plan, as you've imagined it, starts with the identification of my own need or deficits or, or just what, where is my point of growth going to be? And then creating a plan to get there and then actually working the plan. Is it, is it kind of a progression like that where I have to start first with some self-awareness, self-reflection, uh, both about where I am and where I want to go? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so the first exercise that I have you do before you actually write your life plan is I have you write your eulogy. And Bob Buford wrote a book, Halftime, 20-some years ago, 30 years ago. And in there, he, he talked about a consultant that had him write his eulogy and the impact it had on him. And I read that book and I thought, wow, that's fascinating. I'm going to try it. So you write your eulogy and all of a sudden what comes to into light with absolute clarity is Psalm 9012. Because when you imagine that this is being read today at 3.30, this is what your wife's saying about you. These are what your friends are saying about you. This is what your family's saying about you. And you really start to read that as if it were being read today. All of a sudden, we're moving from just cerebral and now we're moving to heart because we're we're coming to grips with the fact that our days really are numbered, but we humans don't believe it. Oftentimes we think, you know what, we can get to that tomorrow. We'll get to it later. I've got another 30 years. I've got 40 years. I don't need to worry about that now. Well, start with eulogy, which then leads you to this place to where you can really evaluate how you're doing in all the areas of your life. I like to say that the life plan is like a life GPS. So we identify our starting point, our current reality. We identify our destination in each one of our accounts. That's our vision. We understand our purpose. What's our purpose or unique role in each of these accounts? And then we map our way there. Specific commitments. Pray with my wife every night before we go to bed. Exercise every day at such and such time. Get so many hours of sleep. Take my wife and my kids on dates. You know, it's all these different things in the different accounts. If I do those things, well, then chances are I'll be building net worth and equity in those accounts looking at them as I am too, as the steward of them and one who gets to shepherd or influence or love on in those accounts. And, uh, and that helps me to, with review, the way that the brain works and executive functions work. If we're going to transform, we need to focus on what matters most. So we inhibit what doesn't. And that's what we need to have it in writing. We need to review it, review it, review it. Just like we need to review the scriptures. You can't read the Bible one time and say, okay, I've got it, right? We're told to meditate on the law day and night. Why? Because we live in a current and always have. We've lived in this culture where we just kind of get off. We just move over here, right? So the Lord, he... He knows. He's like, no, read this all the time because you little humans, I made you and, and you're going to get, get stuck in currency and get off course. Keep reading my stuff. And so focus is a big part of it. Uh, staying focused uh, as yeah. opposed to being detoured, which is so easily done. I think we all understand that. And would you say that everybody has something to start with? In other words, is there somebody that could say, you know what? That works for you. 
uh, you're the guy that lives in suburban, suburban Portland. Uh, that's not me. Uh, I'm in the hood. I, I got nothing to work with. Or maybe I, it's not about a material disadvantage, but I have some physical disadvantages or whatever it is. I mean, it's, it's your premise that every person has something to work with or really some have a much more difficult time. Some have a much more difficult time. But that doesn't mean they can't affect a better tomorrow. Um, probably one of the best letters I received in the last year was from an incarcerated man who is going to do life in jail. And he read Living Forward. And he has a life plan because he wants to be a better version of himself each and every day. And he wrote me this gushing letter. And he leads prisoners through life planning, his fellow inmates. And they're all the ones that want to affect a better tomorrow. Some of them will be released. He won't. And I just think about that. I'm thinking, really? Like, come on. Let's talk about, hey, you know, God says, I will give you a hope and a future. Well, his is, well, on this earth, it's behind bars. But here he is going, hmm, I can be miserable here and take, or I can look to add value here and give. I choose option B. And I have a framework to do it. So, you know, 25 years, hundreds of thousands of people have gone through the process. That book that you have is in like 22 languages. Uh, I'm fascinated. You know, I'm fascinated by cultures, countries that don't have what we have in the States or in Canada. Come on. But there are humans everywhere around the world that come to this place to where they say, I can be used to make a difference with whatever I've been given in whatever circumstances I have, and I choose to. Ah, choose to. Cool. Well, here's a framework. It's not the only one, and it's not the best, but if it helps you, awesome. Well, and I'm just thinking, okay, so where was this guy when I was 22? Uh, so now Ooh. I'm now I'm pressing 70, Daniel, and you're telling me, yeah, it's not too late. Get, get oh, that life going. Late. You are pressing 70? Yeah. So, well, let's not go, let's not detour into that. I'm just saying. Good for you. When, when you're, some people would hear this conversation and think, you know what, that chapter closed for me. And mm -hmm. I'm hearing you say, it doesn't matter where you are in the journey. You can start today and maximize what you have left. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. You just said a few things. Where was this guy when I was 22? The most common response that I've heard from people who have built their life plans, I lead these events in more normal times called the experience, where we'll bring hundreds of people in Central Oregon, Sun River, and we'll do a three and a half day leadership retreat where we focus on self, team, and organizational leadership effectiveness. And we always give them an opportunity in Sun River, which I think you've probably Oh, I've been there. You're, you're familiar with? Oh, for sure. Yeah, come on. So, you know, sitting by those meadows, on those little rivers, people, it looks like a culty thing. And I've got hundreds of leaders out there writing their life plans and they're writing their eulogies and you see them crying and they're, they're building their life plans. And at the end of the day, they come and we all bring them together. And the common response, whether we're doing it public or whether we're doing it private corporations for 25 years, it's been, my gosh, that was transformational. It made such a difference. I can't believe it. I now see I, I see who I want to be in all the areas of my life. And then here comes the line. I so wish somebody would have walked me through this when I was in my 20s. And that's why I started Set Path. That's why we just started it at the end of last year. We're waiting for our IRS designation. We're in beta right now. We're going to bring mentorship to America's young people. So we get rid of that line. Because man, if we could teach people in high school, you know, Jim, I just... Something you don't know about me. We, we have four kids, two of them married, two grandbabies, but we've had nine other kids living with us. I have a 17-year-old living with me now. And from 96 through today, we've had these younger folks as well as some older folks live here, but for the most part, young. Seven of the nine came with some sort of addiction or real problem. It's always been a passion of mine. My wife and I have always taught, uh, you know, middle school, high school level. Uh, this year, we just walked the family that of the 17 year old who's here, she's been here two years. She moved here post suicide attempt. Two months ago, her 15 year old brother did take his life. Mm. 
We walked them through that. They all lived here for a while. I had the privilege of officiating the memorial. Um, why didn't somebody walk me through this when I was in my 20s? I want to transfer belief and hope, which you said something earlier with that word transfer, transferring belief. I want to transfer belief and hope into young 15 now. It was 18 to 30. Now I'm going to go 15 to 30 so that we can show people that they, they were created for a reason and they can affect a better tomorrow. And it is hard, but it's beautiful and it's worth the struggle. It's just beautiful to know that at the end of the day, you go to bed knowing you, you strive to please an audience of one and you were used to flip switches up on the hearts of people. Come on. All of us have that choice, no matter where we grew up, what environment. It is harder for some people to believe because they've had such crappy things happen to them in their lives. Really hard. So I don't take that lightly. And, and we're going to have to be compassionate and a lot of empathy. Well, whether but you're, we show up. Whether you're talking about building champions or set path, it seems to me that your, your concepts operate in a secular world. In other words, I, I, my guess is that you have a lot of client bases who are not coming to you in any faith-based form. Uh, they are accessing what is sensible and reasonable and workable. Uh, but you, you fundamentally seem to me, Daniel, to be someone who is integrating your theology with this vocational calling. And, and even just now, you've described about how important it is that a person, a client sounds kind of mercantile, a, a, a patron, anyone who's coming into this scope has to understand that they are not random, mm -hmm. that there is purpose, there is meaning, there is value in them created in from the beginning. And anyway, I, I'm, I'm asking you, how does your theology, or how fundamental is that, or how do you integrate that, or what do you say to someone who may not be thinking about God, but honestly, is God necessary for us to maximize a life plan, or even to get there, to figure it out? How does God inform my sense at my advanced age of uh, a life plan. What do you think? I, I can I can go in like many directions on that. Um, first off, is the majority of our clients, uh, I would say, have differing faiths. All humans have faith. You and I both know that. Since we can't prove random accident, or we can't prove scientifically that he exists, or which one he is, everyone has faith. Everyone. Some of my most beautiful clients are those that are the most radical atheists. I had a client from France, led a multinational global that if I gave you the name of the company, you've, everybody listening here has most likely drip, dropped their credit card into one of these machines to receive the product. Just about everybody. And uh, he, he said, you know, Daniel, you seem to be uh, a, a man of strong faith, very strong faith. French accent. And I'd been doing a lot of work with this team and he's, he wanted me to be his coach. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm an atheist. And he said, is that going to be a problem for us to work together? And I said, oh my gosh, it's going to make it beautiful and fun for us to work together. We're going to have a blast. And he was truly one of my most favorite clients. I helped him to go from leading this very large publicly traded firm to retirement. And now he's a professor at a great university and he's just a dear man. Love him. Mm -hmm. All right, so how have I integrated? Well, truth, truth, let me just observe, truth works, doesn't it? It's true content. Yeah. And it, it works. That's what it is. So, so I look at it and I think, how has my faith impacted my vocation? Um, so in Colossians, we're told that, um, you know, him we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present all men perfect in Christ Jesus. And to this end, I also labor striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. And then we're told not to allow our, our light to be hidden under a, under a, a bushel. And, you know, we're told that we've been, we've received talents and we're expected to do something with them. You look at the times that we all find ourselves in. You and I are recording this in May of 21. May of 21. In Portland, we just got shut down again. Just got shut down again. What a brutal, brutal going on year and a half, right? By the pandemic. By the pandemic. 
by the pandemic. And you look at, you know, in March of last year, when the pandemic started, I, I was, I started doing these leading in difficult times, little YouTube blurbs and things. And, and I had some real fears. And back then some of my fears that I had, I had no idea that they would come true. They were prophetic. Um, you didn't need to be all that smart to see it, but it's crazy. So I look at these times that we're in right now and, you know, getting back to your question of integrating faith and vocation and all of it. At the end of every year, I go down to my place at the coast, my wife, I do a, a life plan review. I review my life plan. I journal, um, I spend time and just get away and pray. And, and, and then I look for themes and lessons for the, from the year. The missions are the same. The circumstances have changed, but they've always been changing. The mission's the same. The circumstances have changed, but they've always been changing. As you read through the Hebrew scriptures, it's, life's always been a battle. There's always been battles. Now, in our lifetime, we just haven't seen too many of them. And in the last year and a half, we've seen some battles, and they're different. Circumstances have changed, but the mission hasn't. We're told at the end of Matthew why we're here. The Great Commission. Mission's the same. Circumstances have changed. But in a life plan, that is a great, great intersection right here in the conversation. So I can make a life plan based sure. on the world I know now. Sure. But the world is an unpredictable and uh, volatile place. So our, my life plan adapts. It can be adjusted, or, or you've just suggested it's reviewed. You're constantly, uh, it's a living concept that may change and evolve over time. Is that fair? It absolutely will. You know, you can't, and I've been shot down for this from theologians uh, as well as just different naysayers. Like, you can't plan out your life. Well, you're right. You can't. You know, the, the mind of the man direct or the mind of the man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Well, of course you can't, but you can give thought to who you want to become and then how you want to live in the days that you've been given here. And you understand that a life plan isn't something you serve. It serves you. It's a reminder to you of the unique stewardship opportunity you have in the areas of your life that God's entrusted to you. But that doesn't mean if you sit there and say, in the vision part, you know, for my vision with my bride, I say at the age, I've been saying this for years, I'll be 57. At the age 65, we will be one another's best friends. We will be intimate. There will be nobody I would rather spend time with, with my bride. We will laugh together. We will study God's word together. We will romance, we'll have romance with one another. And we will look at our marriage at the age 65 and we will celebrate how God's used our marriage to impact many marriages around us. That's what I dream of. That's got magnetic pull power. That causes me to see the, the ups and the downs that we might have when our emotions go up or down. And I can discount the emotions because I so badly want that reality at 65. Now, does that mean that we're going to get there? Or could something happen that takes either one of us to heaven prior to? Well, of course it can. Could something happen even more evil? Yeah, it could. And then what would I do? Well, then I would pray and I would take it to the Lord and I would say, Lord, I had this account and now I don't, or I had this vision for this account and now circumstances have changed such, what do I do? What should I see? It's just a framework to look at the areas of my life where it's like, Hey, Daniel, I've put you in a unique stewardship role. You're going to be the only husband. You're going to be their only dad. You're going to be the only leader of building champions right now. You're going to be the only one that cares for your body. You're going to be the only one that controls what kind of relationship you and I have. I'll show up all the time, but how about you? It's not magic. I, I get that someone like the French corporate executive could be atheist and benefit from your concepts. Oh, yeah. But it seems like it's a lot more dynamic if I believe there is a God who is actually the manager of the universe and can work things together for the good for me, uh, as I am also, your concept of stewardship implies that I am managing someone else's opportunity. Uh, someone else is the owner. 
uh, of my life or my world or my possessions, my, as you describe them, the different accounts. Uh, both, both ends of it can work, but I'm, I'm resonating with the part that says, yeah, that really has more traction for me as I realize I'm not creating a life plan alone that there is a voice that can speak to me in that definition. But let's move to, to leadership. Uh, as you've just observed, we've lived in a world that's been turned upside down. And even though Portland, uh, sad to say, has found itself uh, in another shutdown as, as the COVID and the vaccine rollout and all that has been a challenge out uh, in Oregon. It seems like the, the pandemic is waning. We, again, we cannot know for sure, but there, is a, there are some fits and starts, but it tends to be waning. That's certainly true where I live at the moment. As a leader or as someone, you know, we say the term leader, you don't have to be the president of the corporation or the head of the company. Uh, all of us have some influence. What should we be looking at as we're, as we're walking out of the crisis? Do you have any advice for a leader who is trying to navigate to a new chapter? Because my sense is the world will not be restored to what it was before. It's some things have just been changed. What should I be looking for? One of the things that I've done for the uh, the last twenty years is I've I've hosted CEO roundtables, and in this last year, I created a virtual CEO roundtable to where I invited my CEO clients, current and past, as well as chairmen uh, and thought leaders in the leadership space that I've had the privilege of journeying with. On this round table, we get together multiple times throughout the year. We have plans to come together live in October. It'll be the first time this group's come together. But in it, you've got the chairman of Delta Airlines, former CEO of Home Depot, uh, president of Chick-fil-A, uh, chairman and CEO of Daimler uh, Trucks Global, which is Mercedes-Benz and multiple brands, uh, Meyer Stores, uh, ah, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. I mean, you just go on and on and on, right? It's just some pretty amazing men and women. That's a power table. It's crazy. And, and, and in it, we've talked, you know, since the pandemic started, how are we changing our leading, our leadership? What's changing in here? What's changing with hands and feet? What are we doing? After we got through the, all right, protect the team phase, it was time to then preserve the business. And when I was in Germany last March and received a 2 a.m. phone call from my bride and then my assistant saying, you need to get home, the, the borders are closing. And I was halfway through an executive retreat with Daimler. And I knew that was going to happen. I actually had my bags, bags packed. But four hours later on a flight, I fly home and I, I'm like, leadership mandates. Protect the team, preserve the business while your, your customers focus on that. You'll make it through. Protect the team, preserve the business while your clients. All right. Back to the round tables. We're all working through that kind of thinking. And we looked at the lessons learned in the first 90 days. Your question is, how should we be looking at leadership? How should we be thinking about our organizations in the midst of a new frontier? Well, the first lesson was, look how quickly so many of us in business pivoted, adjusted, reinvented, and went to work from home. You know, the joke was, if, if somebody would have presented the executive team or the board with an idea that we're going to take everybody and cause them to work from home, you would have hired a you know, Boston Consulting Group. You would have spent millions of dollars. Six months later, they would have come back and they would have told you why it won't work, right? And here we are, most businesses did it in 48 hours. So that ability to think and pivot quickly, you need to have that. Uh, a big line that we all talked about and you saw it all through like Harvard Business Review, et cetera, was you need to think like a startup. Leaders, you need to think startup. You need to really understand the role of technology. You need to understand the role of technology in our systems, in our working workflows, and how we engage in culture. Because technology is changing how people feel, think, believe, and behave. Advertising, marketing, all of it's much different. Outsourcing, much different. I have... I have teammates that have always been spread throughout the country. Since I started the company, I've had people in, in different states. And now it's different. Now we're looking at our clients that are around the world. So what you're looking at is you're looking at 
what role does technology play in workflow and system and supply chain, as well as thinking, belief and behavior of those that we serve? You're thinking speed. In, in my most recent book, I say that you know, a leader's effectiveness is determined by two things, decisions and influence. You need to see your business from seven different perspectives to, in order to lead effectively. In each of those seven, you need to bring a spirit of intentional curiosity. There's no way for a leader to know it all. So you have to be humble enough and curious enough to ask the right questions of the right constituents so that you can get that information and figure out if not you, then who makes that decision and then how do we execute? So really slowing down your thinking and then speeding up your decision-making right now, it's going to be key. So I could go on this topic. Oh, hey, you wrote and, a book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and a good read. But as, as we're thinking about that, what, just as you've described, you, you convene a table of some of the most influential uh, business minds in the world, it seems to me. Uh, and you're also, you're a guy who's living life on the ground. Uh, you, you have a family, you have a community uh, where you live. You, I presume you have a church family and so on. I mean, so there's all different kind of gradations of that. There are people of influence in all of those dimensions. What are the characteristics of a leader in your world that you look for to respect? In other words, you're, you're just looking around thinking, man, that, that gal, that guy, they've got something here. What, what are you looking for? I'll tell you of a, of a few that I so respect and have influenced me. Uh, Tim Tosopoulos is the president of Chick-fil-A. Been a client and friend for years, more than a decade, probably a decade and a half. Martin Dom is the chairman of Daimler out of Stuttgart, Germany. Been a client and friend for the last six, seven years. Respect the heck out of him. These guys both think and behave the same way. And I could plug all sorts of leaders. So if any of you are listening to this, I'm so sorry. You're, the people I get to work with, they, they embody the, the concepts that I'm going to share with you, the attributes that I'm going to share with you. The reason I mention these two is Martin Dom. I heard Martin speak to a group of young adults at a university years ago. And he said, I don't see the tops of people's heads nor do I see the bottoms of their chins. I see their eyes. I look for leaders who see people and they see the value in people. They see that these people are image bearers. They're not mistakes. They're image bearers and they have different stories and they've had different challenges, but they have something to contribute. Every human made in the image of God has something to contribute. Some have grown up in environments and had had situations that have that caused them to not believe it, right? But it's our job to see it. We need to see it. We need to find that bit of goodness in them. And, and then what that does is that changes how you think and feel about people because now people are of value and they have something to contribute and they're not something that are that is this worthless being that they're there to take. It's just a whole different orientation and that impacts how a leader leads. So heart, belief and heart. Now Martin's brilliant. He's a fantastic strategist. He's an amazing team lead guy and he's got quite the success track record. Tim Tosopoulos. Tim Tosopoulos can walk through a convention center with 5,000 people. He moves slowly and he sees people. He says, Jim, how are you? And then by name, he'll recall your wife's name and he'll recall events and he'll remember your kids' names and he'll understand your business. And, and he understands the mechanics of the business so well that he, he gets what it's like to be in the restaurants of Chick-fil-A, as do their entire executive team. They, they spend time in the stores. They have the, the intellect. That's decision-making and influence. They have head and heart. They don't ever believe they're supposed to be the smartest person in the room. I'll connect this back to an earlier question. We were talking about the CEO roundtable and, and leaders needing what they need in these times. They need to have a vision for a better tomorrow. They need to see and believe that if they 
trade the majority of their waking hours to lead the organization. They execute on strategies. They can actually lead the organization to a better tomorrow, to that envisioned future. They, and it's so clear and compelling. They share from it. They engage heads and hearts and they write plans. So leaders today that I respect, they're smart, no doubt about it. They work hard. They're the real deal. You know, when you, when you, when you spend time with them and their spouses and their families, you just see they're the same person at work as they are at home. They're in, integrated. They love people. And they know that they're in this seat, the leadership seat for a reason. They don't need to be the best, smartest, fastest. They need to surround themselves with the right team that will enable them to move the organization to that vision that they believe is going to be a, uh, a place that adds even more value to the community and world in which they operate. Certain authenticity, I guess, is always key to leading others. Uh, you know, you can only pretend and be an actor so long. <laughs> Sooner or later, yeah. you're off stage and and the uh, the persona crumbles. So I, I appreciate that. You described that these are people of vision and that they have. you have to believe in a better tomorrow. I mean, that's a very optimistic take on a challenging world. So I'm extrapolating that you would see yourself as an optimist. And if you're going to be a champion or you're going to find your set path or you're going to develop a life plan that actually works. There has to be some kind of optimism to it. What makes you optimistic? Uh, as you look forward, are you optimistic? Incredibly. Because? Incredibly. Well, because my destiny is taken care of. I'm promised a place of no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow. I'm promised an opportunity to live out gifts for eternity and to be in the presence of the one who created me. So my faith, my faith is the source for my optimism. If I believe that my existence is numbered by, you know, average lifespan of 78 years and that's it. Well, it's a little hard to be optimistic about that because I've got body parts that, you know, the warranty's starting to wear out and, and end. And, and if there is no better tomorrow, I mean, I'm, I'm journeying, with my parents right now, both 82, my dad's got dementia. It's pretty rough. And if that's it, I can't look at you and say, I believe in a better tomorrow. I'd be an idiot. But if I believe that I get eternity to look forward to, changes everything. So here's a really interesting phenomenon, leaders, if we believe that the next chapter, the eternal chapter is better than this one, then we have to be aware of the fact that as humans who feel and use logic and data to support our decision-making and our natural tendencies, we've all seen little kids. You know, I've got granddaughters at one and, and two months old and I, I watch, and, you know, you, you, the kids want to take, take, mine, 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 right? That's like in us. Well, as we age, we do the same thing. We just want to kind of build a fence around what we've created over the last 50 years, 60 years, 70 years. I just want to build a fence and I just want to enjoy. Let me build a fence around it, protect it, keep the wolves out. Let me, let me just protect it and enjoy. And I say, oh gosh, no, that is not the way I want to think. The closer I get to eternity, the more risk I want to take the more ground I want to take, the more I want to be used, the more I want to give away, the greater the difference. Like I want to go out of here, just poof, flames on the back of my shoes because look where I get to go. I should be running towards it, not trying to like protect. And, and, and I, I see such a difference. I've got some partners, Jim, that are in their seventies, guys on my team in their seventies, some gals that huh, just wonderful people. They, they share that belief. They're inspirational. They're amazing to just sit by and, and listen to and ask questions and then observe how they're living their lives. They give away, give away, give away. They learn new, they risk new. It's beautiful. If you don't, this starts to go. And then the fruit starts to wither. I uh, long, a t long ago decided that if I didn't have something to look forward to, it would rob my present 
of joy. Mm -hmm. And that joy in the present actually is found because I know there's something still to come. Yeah. All right. So if you could do anything you wanted just for fun, what are you going to do? Uh, it's pretty simple. I've been trying to reserve this little surf resort in Mexico. <laughs> um, you folks wouldn't find this to be at all glamorous. I, it would be my sons, my daughter, the other 17 year old girl, some of my high school friends, uh, my nephews, uh, and, and we would go down there um, right about now. And we would go experience five days of warm, beautiful surf. I can't get it done right now. I'm trying. I'm I know, trying. But I get, yeah, the, your, your childhood has framed you forever and you want to go to the surf. I get that. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. me. I, I yeah. do. Okay. Um, now, tell me, if you could have anything for dinner tonight, what do you want to have? I think, I think Sherry and I are going to go to Bamboo Sushi. So we're oh. going to go have some sushi tonight. Yeah. Last night, we did Taco Tuesday. We had about, I don't know, probably 18 here, including my parents, which is a normal deal. We always have big, big meals here. Taco Tuesday is a big one. And then we had pork hay no, which is great Mexican Monday. So you'll know that I love the Mexican food. I love the sushi. I love the healthy. And yeah. Okay. How about you? How about you? No, no. I was just going to say, I thought you were my brother, but then you did that sushi thing and I'm out. I'm sorry. (laughs) I can't do it, but I'm with you. I'm so glad someone likes it because there's all those sushi restaurants that need to live. So I'm good for that. Yes, they do. So if you go anywhere for to dinner tonight, where are you going? Uh, Any food? This this will talk about not glamorous. So I'm from the Northwest. I grew up on Friday nights when I was a child. My dad and I always got to do dinner. Huh. And so I was an only child. So this was a thing my dad and I did every yeah. Friday night. And you know what my thing was? Nally's huh. Chili. You know Nally's? Well, Nally's is a brand from Tacoma. And they make a can of chili. And you can't buy it where I live, but Amazon will ship me a case and I'm having a can of Nally's chili tonight because I talked to my wife. I said, honey, I just want to do the, you know, my, my little trip back home. And she's, she's for it. So there we go. I love it. I love it. You know what? You All mentioned, right. Daniel, earlier on that at one point in your life, you imagined yourself going to law school. And mm-hmm. then uh, you decided that wasn't necessarily your track and required a certain maybe discipline of study that was not you. I'm just telling you, I, I had that same thing. And I actually went to law school. And as I've listened to your talk today, I just want you to know, I th- you could have nailed it. You could have nailed it <laughs> because <laughs> your mind, your analytic, your logic, and your Ooh, heart thanks. is what the law requires. It's been such a, a pleasure to talk to you today, Daniel. Thank you so much for what you do, what you represent, and uh, just taking your time to talk to us today. Yeah, uh, You are fun to talk with. You're a great guy to talk to. Well, and... Uh, I would love to reverse a lot of these questions to learn more about you and your story, because I, I know as our, our mutual friend, Ben San has connected us and, and highly he speaks of you. Um, I know you could take every one of my responses and add to them and multiply the, uh, the stories and the insights. So thank you for being humble and allowing me to join you. And uh, our pleasure all together and uh, same right back at you. God bless. Beautiful. You too. For more information, visit allthattosay.org. Thank you for joining the conversation. Don't forget to like and subscribe.